very excited about reviewing this book, you guys. This is um, right up my alley because it's a photography book. And this is William Mumbler, spirit photographer. And it's The Strange Case of William Mumbler. This was written in 2008. It's by Lewis Kaplan from the University of Minnesota. Um, it's 243 pages. It's illustrated. And I read this right after it hot off the press in 2008. And I've been rereading it since um, in order to be able to do this video. And I have notes from whenever I read this in 2008. And I'm going to just quickly go over this with you. So um, in our quest to understand mediumship and spirituality, well, more or less mediumship is what I'm really interested in. I think it's a good idea to have a good basis of historical fact, what was going on, what led up to the modern day mediums that we know today. And there was a lot going on. There's a lot of history. It's rich. It's interesting. And this book does a pretty darn good job of using primary sources. Now, primary sources are like newspaper clippings from the day or photographs from that time or a diary written at a certain point of time. So those are primary sources. And uh, Wikipedia, if you're uh, becoming a Wikipedia editor, we only use secondary sources. And those secondary sources have to be from places that are notable. In other words, somebody else has to write about the thing. And then that person who writes about that thing needs to be somebody who has some prominence. So this is a great primary source. Now there's, it's got some photographs in here and I'm just going to briefly show them because you can Google this. And there's so many different kinds out there in the world. Uh, the most famous one is uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. This one right here with Abraham Lincoln looking over her shoulder. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that she went under an alias and then Lincoln shows up and it's like, yeah, huh, sure. Your spirit hands there. It's really interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to steer you to a video written uh, done by the Eastman Kodak Company at the museum after I give you a little bit of what I thought about this book. So this was one of the first paranormal like books that I'd ever read, but from a historical perspective, because this man who wrote this, Louis Kaplan, he's a, um, uh, a historian and he has uh, he's also an expert on the theory of photography. So he does a really good job putting together all those primary sources. So the first thing he does is he is, um, uh, he starts out with the history of an overview of each chapter. And there's, there's a lot of different chapters in the book, uh, newspaper articles about uh, the business Mumler. How do I say this? Mumbler had his business. These are newspaper articles. There are, there's a book excerpt from P.T. Barton, the P.T. Barnum dude who had the circuses. You all know him. And he calls them humbugs. He has a whole chapter in uh, P.T. Barnum wrote about Mumbler. So that was interesting too. Then it's Mumbler's personal archives, his memoirs, and full of secondhand accounts. And then we have the prosecuting attorney who sums up the court case because he was taken, Mum, Mumler was taken to court. This is in the 1800s, 1870s, I think now. I'm trying to remember all of a sudden, you know how it is with it comes to years, you kind of freeze because you're like, oh my gosh, that is a fact. I have to know that fact. I think this is 1770s. Anyway, so he had... Huh. It's not important at this moment. It's after the Civil War. He had been accused of, of uh, faking the photographs. No kidding. But at the time, it was total, totally believable because uh, remember, photography was a new thing and just amazing things had been happening in the world, you, you know, inventions and so on. So to the average person who, who, um, um, just existed in a normal day, things like um, a photography and telegraphs and, you know, all, all sorts of other amazing inventions, hot air balloons, I guess, just to say that you could, you could 
not only contact the dead, but you could ha take a picture with the dead and they, your loved one would appear somewhere around you or behind you or whatever. His spiritualism was a, was a fairly new thing, kind of started with the, with the Fox sisters in 1848. So this photographer really was uh, pretty smart and got in on the game. I think he invented it by accident. He had a slide that he had in these glass slides and he hadn't cleaned it really well. And he had a picture, I think of his cousin on the slide. And then when he took a self portrait of himself and then developed it, he saw the faint impression of his cousin on there. And he thought, Hmm, I, I have an idea. This is a light bulb moment. And <laughs> I think he was charging $10. Now $10 and 18 70s was a lot of money. So they had a lot of clients, a lot of very wealthy clients. But he was um he was uh, taken to court for for fraudulent, you know, by by doing this this thing. I guess somebody had gone in, a sheriff or something had gone in and had his picture taken and turned out that there was a spirit that came over the top of him and it was really interesting, but so what happens is there's a long, long, um, uh, the, the prosecutor, um, you know, court case on it. It's very interesting to read. So this is, this is fascinating. The, um, then the author in the very last part of the book, he gives us the theory behind ghosts and histor in historical thought. So that's how he kind of sums up the book. Oh, by the way, uh, the photographer he's found not guilty there wasn't enough evidence to prove that he had actually uh was defrauding people um but even though some of the people who were appearing in the photograph from the dead were actually people who were alive i think there was a civil war photograph of a woman whose son was had died in the civil war and she went in and had a photograph taken and then the son shows up and then she um you know, a month or so passes and then the sun comes home from the war and she still believed, she still believed that's, that's the power of, of belief. And I think that's what I thought was really fascinating is that how he was able to continue this, you know, was he a believer? Was he a crook at the beginning of his career? Um, you know, it, in time, it was obvious what he was doing. And he knew darn well what he was doing because he even had assistants helping him out and he had to teach him how to do it. So they knew what this book is missing is I think it, it would be better. I think another book could be written using the primary sources in here by somebody who um, will put it into more of a story format. So it's more, how do I say this? So you're not reading primary sources, but you're, you're, it's being told a story throughout and maybe even bringing in a few other people into the, into the narrative talking about uh, photography. The other thing that I think is really sad that it's missing is that they don't really, he he writes out the instructions and how they were able to make the spirit photography on glass, but there's no illustrations of how it looks. There's no machines uh, in here that show you how they did it or anything of that sort. And I think that was, when I was reading this in 2008, I was really disappointed because I, I didn't have that visual of how he was able to do it. The other question that I don't think is answered in this book that I found really in, uh, like on the top of my mind throughout the whole time I'm reading it is when somebody says they want to have their portrait taken and they have, have it done and then the spirit comes in, sometimes the spirit is definitely their family member and there was rumor that people would that uh, the photographer would go into the house of the person and steal a photograph that they had and then they would you know superimpose it on the glass slide so what i don't quite know is did how do we say this like here's a picture of my dad here's a picture of my dad so was this photograph superimposed behind the person and so that when i when it's developed here i am 
And my dad in this exact pose and the exact clothes where he's winking at the camera and he's got his cane right there. Is this exactly the thing that shows up behind me? And if so, how, how does a person, how do you believe that? Because you'd be just like, that's exactly the photograph I have at home. The exact photograph, the exact pose, the same clothes he's wearing. And that, that would be like really obvious. Or does a photograph appear like maybe the person's face and it's hazy enough and then they're wearing different clothing and a different pose, you know, like their hands aren't like this or whatever their hands are doing in the picture. Is it so different? Because then that would seem to be a little more believable, except I don't know why they're wearing clothes, but you know, that's, that's beside the, 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 you know, this is that time we have to have clothes on. So I would like to have had that question answered because it, it isn't clear. Um, there's so many really interesting um, stories about it here. And I think that this is another thing that I wanted to mention is they, at a certain point, he, the photographer gets to a point where they, they bring in a person brings in a photograph here and a photograph and they put it on this table. And then this must've been super easy because you don't even have a, a person sitting there. You don't have to prep a person. And then they take the picture and then the image appears. So I'm not quite sure I remember how it was that that, why they were doing that instead of bringing a human being in. But I guess as a gift for somebody to say, my brother's, I'm going to give a gift to my brother and I want to, and he's not here. So here's a picture of my brother. Now see what materializes around him and maybe, I don't know, but I just thought that was fascinating. So this is a great book, nice illustrations. Um, I think that this is a great resource for somebody who wants to write a book about the telling more of a story about what was going on. Something a little more readable as far as um, not just reading the sources at that time. The last thing I want to mention is, and I'm going to put this in the description under this video, is that um, we're on Halloween each year, which is fun. The Eastman Museum, which is like Eastern Kodak Museum, will do different um, lectures and exhibits on this kind of photography, spirit photography. And during the pandemic, which had its benefits, which was that things were online. So things you normally wouldn't have been able to go visit, you could see online, they would do something online. And they came out with this wonderful video. They did a lecture that I attended over Zoom and it had all kinds of photography and how the spirit photography was created. And this was done in two, 2020. So it shows how how they did. They, they go into the museum and they show the glass slides and how it was reproduced. So all that information that I wish I'd had back in 2008 it's in this video. And you can also find a lot of other things online on, on spirit photography. One of the things that bothers me the most is whenever people use, um, you know, ghosts and, and this kind of, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's, it's a piece of history, especially when you get to see the person dressed the way they were, you know, because they got dressed and got all dressed up and had their picture taken because it wasn't cheap. Um, so I find that interesting to see these people, but when they use these things to, to embellish history, it bothers me a lot, um, back, oh my gosh, it's been over 20 years ago. There was a, there was a, like a home I used to go to up in Carson city that was a historical homes and you go through the tour of the home, you look at the kitchen, you look at the, you know, the bedrooms and, and the you know, where they, all the interesting things that happened in the house. And then as you were getting ready to exit, there was a, a photograph of this woman who had owned the house and a spare photograph of the child in the background behind the mother. And the tour guide, I did this tour at least three times. And the tour guide would say, oh, this is back before um, double exposure photography was invented. So this was a ghost photograph and this is a real ghost. And they would always say that. And it bothered me, and I and, and I believe, and I'm trying to remember, uh, you know, wasn't I was a little more shy back then. I didn't wasn't confrontational. Um, that I think I remember telling them, you know, come on, drop that. That's that's ridiculous. Of course, 
they had double exposure photography. That is not a real ghost. But um, it bugged me because the, the history behind that photograph was much more interesting. That this was a time of the of, of in the world where spiritualism and mentalism, not mentalism, mediumship was all coming about and people were were dipping into this and all the history behind that, the women's movement, um, the age of photography beginning and how they were able to figure this out with glass plates and this invention of uh, this new technique with photography. That is interesting. And how this woman really did believe it was a ghost and she had it taken. And that was a sign of wealth because she was able to have this photograph taken. And that is interesting. That is a part of history. But to go on and, and like really put these people down as in, oh yeah, well, they didn't know what they were doing. And photography, that was too sophisticated for these kind of people. They couldn't have figured out how to do a double exposure. Oh, come on, give me a break. And then... <laughs> And that uh, these people, um, you know, just humans weren't smart enough to be able to do that. And this was happening in Nevada. And spiritualism was a big thing in the East Coast. So, um, you know, it really tied into the history of that home that I think she had lived in the East Coast at some point and had the picture taken and come back. So all that is fascinating. So it really bugs me when people have to throw in the ghost element just to make a buck, you know, to turn... To make it sound like, you know, just ignore the whole history of this of this building that you've just walked through and that you've been fascinated with and you've asked lots of questions and it's so interesting. Why are the beds so small? And you know, and the you know, because people were shorter back then. And look at the clothing they wore and how did they take care of a child and how did they make these foods that they made? That's fascinating. Then you get all the way done and you're like, oh, and it was a ghost. Thanks a lot, you know. I was that just kind of ruined it for me but if you like these kinds of videos i plan on doing more i really enjoy uh reading i love to read and i think that it's important that we have you know some basis of how we could get we could get um understand media mediumship and the history of mediumship and and learning about this by looking at our past and some of the books that have been written and the things of the past so check it out. He also has a really good Wikipedia page. So you might want to look at that. His name is William Mumler, M-U-M-L-E-R. So check out this book. I think you will find it fascinating. And go online, look at the description, and you'll get the links to the uh, Eastman Museum and the videos that I was talking about. Like and share. <laughs>